My friends, the great experiment. Prodigy. Prodigy. Hidden. Trick. Trick. Did you look at that? The greatest trick. Trick. And you people, you're all astronauts. Are some kind of star. Trick. Trick. The greatest trick. Welcome to Greatest Trek. It's a new Star Trek podcast from the makers of the Greatest Generation. But you shouldn't let that deter you. I'm Ben Harrison. I'm Adam Pranica. You hear this all the time that every episode of your podcast could be someone's first time listening. And you want to take that seriously. It could also be their last time listening. So we really better leave it all out on the podcast field, right? Yeah, more often than not, it's their last time, I think. <laughs> Most of the time, same, right? You joke. You joke because you're modest and because you're uncomfortable with success. Mm. But our shows have continued to grow from jump. It may not be a hockey stick style Al Gore <laughs> end of the world style graph, but like yeah. the line moves ever upward and always has. It's nice. It's uh, it's just confirmation that people are still out there recommending whatever this is to other people. Yeah. There's a place out there for whatever this is. Yeah. I'm convinced. I mean, people are sending warning boys all over the <laughs> all over the damn internet. They really are. Yeah. And it's a good thing too, because this is all we got going. <laughs> it's true. It's a Tuesday as we record this. Yeah. You and I went to a, a late night comedy show last night together. We did. I usually, it felt weird to me, Ben, because I usually just buy tickets to things and then don't go. That's the Seattle in me. Uh I feel good about the support of the act, but uh, I just get too tired (laughs) most times to go to the thing. But we played a game of it's too late chicken with each other last night and neither of us flinched. We both went. Yeah, it was, uh, I think that that actually kind of works for me in the moment of my life Mm -hmm. that I'm in right now, the show on a Monday night that starts at 9.30 because I was able to feed my baby, like sing him some lullabies, put him to bed, then go out and prepare dinner, sit down with my wife and eat dinner while we watched a couple of 22-minute episodes of something. Mm -hmm. And then I got in the car and I went and had another night with my buddy Adam. That is usable, valuable time between the hours of 9 and 11. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, we should do that more often. Yeah. We tried to get our friend and agent to come to the show with us, but... Yeah, uh, he big dogged he, us, didn't he? He's like, oh yeah, I'm having dinner in Beverly Hills with a client. Yeah. <laughs> Not a surprise there. Yeah. That's an excuse he can use at any time. We'll never ask follow-up questions. I wish I had that excuse in my back pocket. Yeah, yeah. But you have no no clients anymore. Meeting with an important person is... Just not something that anyone would believe. (laughs) It was a fun show. It was a comedian that you and I both uh, like very much and have seen perform. Yeah. I don't know if we should say the name or not, but... uh, Go ahead and say it. it. Okay. It was Rory Scovel. Yeah. A guy that I've seen do half hours plenty of times Mm -hmm. on, you know, little, you know, $5 a ticket shows in LA, yeah, which is one of the great benefits of living in LA is you can see like really great national touring acts like working out material on any given night for almost no money. True. And uh, you said he's running an hour. And I was like, wow. So it'll be like seeing whatever his next special is before it's recorded. Like that must be what he's doing. He's running his hour. Yeah, and we realized fairly quickly that I had misspoken <laughs> because it was billed as an hour with Rory Scovel and it was off the rails, fun and weird and like just just the thing you want <laughs> on a Monday night out seeing comedy. I loved it. I loved it too. I will say that at, at least 30 minutes of showtime for me were me wondering, is he going to stop doing this and start doing the hour soon? <laughs> Which I think is probably what people like the first timers listening to our show are doing right now. When do they get to the stuff about Star Trek? <laughs> as soon as Daniel Van Kirk got up on stage with him, I was like, oh, this is going to be great. This is just going to be two comics hitting dingers off of each other for an hour. And that's what it was. Just pitch yeah. and catch. It was great. Yeah. Yeah, really using the space in, yeah. in a way that I, I really admired. Yeah. That was a fun night out. Yeah, the Elysian Theater made it comfortable. Good job by them. 
I guess the moral of the story is go see a comedy show. That's a recommendation from your friends, Ben and Adam. Yeah, go see it on a Monday night. <laughs> see it after the Monday night football game is over. You've got time. Yeah. Oh, did you watch a, a football game also? Of course. Come on. It, wow. It's football betting season, Ben. All I do is bet, bet, bet. No That's your putting the baby to bed. <laughs> yeah, putting the parlay to bed is, is what I did before going out <laughs> to see comedy with you. Wow. How'd you do? Anything to report? Oh, I did fine this weekend. Not great, not bad. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's a long season. Not bad is good, right? Yeah. I consider success a season long measurement and not a week to week thing. So <laughs> you, you measure from the base. I measure, <laughs> I start to measure after the Super Bowl, is what I do. <laughs> uh, yeah. Don't put that oh, on your Oh, shit. Uh, I can't even say that. I, I, I start to measure after the big game. Oh. The big game. What is the deal with that? They sue you if you say the name of it? I only know two rules in broadcasting. They sue you for saying Super Bowl, and they sue you for singing Happy Birthday. And that's why I don't do either <laughs> on our shows. Um, happy That Happy Birthday one is in the clear now. A, a yeah. lawsuit established its place in the public domain. So oh, good. Sing it all you want, buddy. Can't wait. Yeah, I should have sung it to you, your birthday being not that long ago. We still haven't done a thing for your birthday, and it's something I feel bad about. Oh, well, last night was uh, was plenty fun. Do you want to get into the episode today? It might be an episode that inspires us to sing a different song, Adam. See you at the crossroads. Because <laughs> I'm going to miss everybody. I'm going to miss everybody. I love the idea of you singing a lullaby to your little kid. Yeah, I actually have been singing a lot of like pop music in lullaby format. And uh, yeah, just like when you actually look up the lyrics to some of these songs, you're like, oh, this one's about sending dick pics. All right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. All right, Ben, let's get into it. It's Star Trek Prodigy, season one, episode 14. Crossroads. You know the greatest danger facing us is a rational fear of the unknown. Future unknown. On my mark, go back. We start not with the proto star, but with the USS shovel and with uh, the diviner kind of working with Ensign Essencia on his memory stuff. My memories. Will they ever come back? You see them arm in arm, and I was only thinking one thing, Ben. Mm. This is an old getting helped to the bathroom. <laughs> like, you know what this looks like when there's a a healthcare provider, like carrying someone who can't really walk that well around. Where else could they be going? Is Ensign Essencia the Ensign Hazmat of the USS Shovel? Like, is she wiping that ass? I mean, <laughs> maybe. Is the but- Diviner's, like... Is the suit that he's in normally like a still suit from Dune where there's like pads in the thighs that process the shit and and like create more liquid to pump through his veins? I don't think enough is made about what kind of alien the diviner is and what problems that presents to the crew of the USS shovel because they're clearly not beaming the waste products out of him yeah. as they walk him to and from the bathroom. You've come so far. Don't give up now. Because they don't know anything about his anatomy. Right. That's something that uh, that Dr. George yeah. established early on. Yeah, and the diviner can't tell them anything about himself because of the memory loss. Yeah, yeah. Or so he says, and I don't know if this is something that all of the episodes leading up to now have been like, never trust the diviner. The diviner is scheming. The diviner is bad and evil. I've never quite believed the memory loss thing, even though I'm probably supposed to, right? Because Gwen definitely got scrambled because she yeah. well, she saw the reflection of it. Yeah. Am I remembering that correctly? I mean, I, I definitely lost some memory from that scene. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Zero took it away from all of us. Yeah. But yeah, like if he doesn't have any memory of his like vendetta, then he kind of becomes a neutral character, right? He's not really somebody we can treat as a villain anymore. Yeah, and how he acts when no one is around is really the supporting argument for memory loss is real for him. Yeah. 
I mean, he's starting to get bits and pieces of it back. When Janeway comes down, she jogs something loose, which is Gwendala, the name of his daughter. God. So maybe like eventually he gets like name of daughter, name of ship he wants, and then eventually he'll get to Vendetta. Gwendala Diviner is like a stripper <laughs> name, right? <laughs> Everyone put him together for Gwendala. Definitely an interesting drag character. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> what do you Gwendala Diviner? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There are Star Trek drag shows. This is right there for the taking. Yeah. Yeah. Take it and use it. <laughs> take this <laughs> take this suggestion from Ben and Adam <laughs> on what to do at your next drag show. <laughs> we have great ideas about everything. Yeah. We have lots to offer. Over on the Protostar, they are, uh, you know, at the end of the last episode, they're like, well, we just can't go to Starfleet with this ship, but we still want to go to it. And so this is a scene about them burying the protostar under the ice yeah. of an ice planet. They're getting ready to pack everything up. They're wearing like these these high-necked fur collar jackets. Yeah. These are cool jackets. Yeah. They don't have the badge on the outside, which I feel like would have saved a lot of misunderstanding in this episode. I think so too. Rock Talk is stashing Murph in a pelican case while he's going through a pupil stage. Ben, this is something I only know about because of Gremlins, mm, yeah. this pupil stage. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of like an over-the-shoulder kind of backpack yeah. for Murph. Yeah. Murph Hatton Portage, if you will. Sure. But there seems to be technology in there. Like Rock Talk isn't just uh, throwing the pupa in a bag. Do you think Zero has a couple of different containers oh like if there's like another one in the closet in zero's quarters could they just put the egg in that yeah that's what i was thinking i like that idea kind of egg shaped what is zero doing to operate that machinery is there are there little like tendrils of of mist operating joysticks in there i don't know like krang are you out of your <laughs> skull <laughs> look who's talking i mean without the suit someone would have to carry the zero huh yeah, you got to have a lot of special like protective equipment for that, right? I know. Yeah. Yeah. They have to put Hologram Janeway to sleep to do this. And Hologram Janeway's like, don't worry about me, kiddos. I'm not going to be bored or anything. I won't miss you at all. You remember what a big, big deal it was in the early episodes for there to be that thing in this part of the Protostar that could make you any vehicle or any device or any piece of clothing or whatever. Yeah. We haven't seen that in so long. And like, there was that one episode that started with the vehicle where we're underwater. We don't get to see that get made. Yeah. We haven't seen anything get made inside the Protostar in a long time, and I wonder why. Yeah, I mean, I guess I didn't even think when I saw that underwater vehicle, how did this get made? <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> you're right, they have the technology, but instead they choose to hike in. Right. They like trigger an avalanche that covers the ship with snow, and then they like walk across the ice to Ice Moss Isley. Mm hmm. Could I punch that up a little bit? Okay. How about Moss Isley? Ooh, I really like that. Yeah. Okay. That's really solid. Okay, cool. You will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. <laughs> We should fit right in. What was the thing about Jenkum being Tellerite royalty? I, I couldn't connect that to anything in my memory. And again, I've been looking at Zero for a long time, <laughs> so my memory is completely pulverized. <laughs> I really made a bad choice in making a picture of Zero the lock screen on my phone. <laughs> yeah. I just immediately forget every phone yeah. call I, I have up until then. Why did I even open this thing up? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I guess I'll check Twitter. <laughs> yeah. We got an outrageous Okana in this episode, Adam. Yeah, this is great. Played by Okana Actual, yeah. Billy Campbell. Really cool. We can do better than this guy. Hold on. Is that a woman's voice I hear? And remember, Ben, this is the second time we've seen him in new Star Trek. He showed up in Lower Decks as the DJ of that command conference after party. That's true. He's been busy. He had an eye patch then, so this isn't a new thing. <laughs> for him something happened to his face yeah yeah how'd you like to have a disfigured face 
mm. and have to wear an eye patch, but still look as good as this guy. He looks amazing. Now, that's sex appeal. Yeah. I mean, some people just have the face for... Disfigurement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dan Crenshaw, for all the toxicity of his politics, looks fucking great. <laughs> Yeah, that was the example. All right. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I thought it was just a, a great deal of fun that in the Moss Isley of Star Trek, they meet the Han Solo of Star Trek, and he's trying to offer them a ride. Yeah. They quickly demur on doing business with him because he gets in trouble with the authorities. Some Zindi insect men mm. catch him with some kind of contraband. You know, he's always been into globes and globe-shaped things. Sure. And when he gets caught with these. <laughs> Those aren't mine. Just holding them for a friend. It's a bad scene for him. And he, when he's dragged away and arrested, the gang just, they don't know this guy. Yeah. <laughs> they just sort of back away and let it happen. I had a friend get uh, kicked out of a bar one time for trying to steal something. And I was like, oh, I guess I got to leave the bar also. But also, I disavow any knowledge of this person. <laughs> I had to think really hard about whether you were telling a story about me, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't. You're not a thief. As that story unfolded, I was like, can I be sure? <laughs> <laughs> what a jerk, whoever that was. Yeah. What a, what a remarkably passive-aggressive thing of me to do, to call you out to, to put you on blast like that on the show. <laughs> that is a line we never cross with each other. Never. <laughs> Adam, we had a bet about Barnus Franks. Sure did. Want to hear it? Yeah, let's, let's play that back right now. We haven't done bets in a while on this show. Uh-huh. I'm betting on this. RSVP Barnus Franks. Wow, you think he dies? There's a lot of fire happening here within the station goes up. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> that is unfortunate. I'm, I'm glad you did better on uh, your, your Sunday football yeah. bets than you did on that one, Adam. I had a little bit of sugar to lose. <laughs> that was the house money I put on that. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, he's in the depot. That they are headed to. The, everybody's headed to the depot. Sure. That's where everything happens. Like the Kazon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. These guys have really gotten far afield these days. I mean, this is a real Delta Quadrant alien name check kind of show at this point, right? It is. What was Barnes doing with these people? Like, he's just like explaining himself to some strangers? That's a great question because... Our core character's mission for being here is to find a ride back to Starfleet without their ship. Right. Is that not what Barnus is also doing? It would seem like that's not what he's there to do. And if it isn't, what is his mission? <laughs> yeah. And I'm just kind of confused about where this depot is in space because it's got some D quad and some a quad aliens, but also like where the episode ends up makes me think that the, this is like prime a quad. Do you really call depots depots? Is that really what, <laughs> how you say it? I'm just, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> making fun pronunciations. It's kind of like part of the DNA of our show. So if a, uh, if a warehouse was set up where uh, distribution of goods was to take place and it's somewhere on the map, would that be a, a deposition <laughs> to you? Yeah, yes. And uh, <laughs> if you talk about w the work that the word on is doing in that sentence, that's a deposition preposition. <laughs> Barnus is kind of doing the opposite of what our main characters are doing because Barnus is wearing his comm badge on his jacket, which is slung over the back of his chair, Yeah, where our core characters are wearing the comm badges inside the jacket. Yeah. They're hiding their badges under a bushel. Right. And uh, when the camera racks in on Barnus's comm badge, you can see that it's been chirping for quite a while. Yeah. He turned like the, the switch to silent and he's not noticing the, the vibration. Silence is the only setting for a communications device, in my mind. Yeah, it's, it's the way to leave it. He isn't answering his communicator. Some Starfleet officer. So he's not noticing that there's somebody that wants to talk to him. The kids are now wandering around 
trying to arrange a ride for themselves. And Rock Talk is having no luck because uh, she's scaring everyone. I mean, we remember this when the Universal translators weren't on, that the way Rock Talk sounds is terrifying. Right. I guess everybody here would have Universal translators, but the imposing size of Rock Talk is... uh, Don't judge me because I'm big! I guess then the mouth are the things that, <laughs> that scare people away from offering her a ride. The crew of the USS Shovel has beamed down to this facility at this point to look for Barnes. Yeah. There are several scenes where the crew of the Protostar sort of incidentally run into them. Yeah, and uh, Rock Talk does not notice a Starfleet that walks by, but uh, Jenkin Pog runs right into oh! Dr. George. Excuse me! Jankum was walking here. Wandering aimlessly could hardly be considered walk. (laughs) (laughs) And really gets dragged. Yeah, this really hurts. This is not great starfleeting by this doctor. Not all Tuskmen is really the point of this, because Jankum Pog is like, cool, it's one of me. And Dr. George is like, I don't think so. (laughs) Yeah, apparently Pog is Tellerite for runt, and this really just shatters Jankum Pog's royal conception of identity. Yeah, Tuskmen like him are furniture to the upper class yeah. in Tuskmen society. A tall, skinny Tuskmen. Yeah. Gwyn chats up a Klingon outside who's, who's wrenching on his ship, and this guy wants to fight before Ensign Essentia steps in between them to kind of defuse it. Yeah, and and when he sees the Starfleet badge on her, he marches away. But then, like, she turns and starts talking to Gwyn, and it doesn't seem like Ensign Essentia recognizes that Gwyn is in a Starfleet away team jacket. (laughs) It takes Gwyn dropping her hood for Essentia to sort of put the pieces together because Gwyn looks a lot like her father. Yeah, and when Essentia says, like, hey, I know your dad. We should be buddies. Yeah. That really goes over like a lead balloon. Yeah. This really spooks Gwen out, and she runs away real fast. Yeah. It's Dal that actually overhears Janeway's voice, Janeway actual. And it's so interesting, if Janeway doesn't know you, what stranger Janeway sounds like, because we so rarely get this treatment from her. In all of the episodes of Star Trek Voyager, we see... You know, we mostly see interactions between Janeway and her crew, and those are familiar moments. Right. But this stranger Janeway talking to a stranger in this facility feels so different. It does. I thought that this was quite a potent depiction of how confusing the adult world can be when you're a kid. Mm -hmm. Like this whole sequence with, you know, Pog and Rock Talk and Gwen and everybody, like they, they... have this idea of what they want and the way they are approaching it in an adult context is just not working and they don't really have any understanding of why. And I really responded to that. I think that that's really well observed in this episode. And yeah, Janeway is, uh, you know, somewhat receptive to Dal saying like, I I really want to be in Starfleet. But uh, she also isn't there for that. So when business comes up, she turns away from him and uh, she meets Barnes. I want to note something about this scene before we move on. And that's like, I think Jason Manzukis is often asked to play Pog so broadly, like in either direction. Like he's very emotional as a character. Yeah. And so to see him go from mega excited to see Janeway to super nervous about meeting Santa and not really knowing (laughs) how to ask for the thing that you want more than anything, and also to be doing that right after having your tusk smashed in by Dr. George, like there's a lot going on in this scene. And I think this is some of Jason Manzukas' best work on the show is like this moment. Yeah. Making us feel all of those things at once. So with Barnes in front of her, Janeway is like, what happened to your communication station? (laughs) And he starts telling the story and, you know, rattles off the list of species of the gangsters that did this to him. And when he gets to his description of Dal's creepy dingle dangle, 
Janeway realizes she was just talking to one of the perpetrators, as she imagines it. I love how Dal Pee Wee Herman's the moment that he's overhearing. Like, like <laughs> Barnes is talking about this roving gang of psychos who destroyed his station. <laughs> and Dal from around a barrel is like, I say we let him go. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. When Janeway realizes that... Uh, the bad guys are here. She orders the depot locked down or depot, depending on who you ask. What do you make of her dropping her coffee mug at this realization? And it (laughs) direct homage to Kevin Spacey at the end of Usual Suspects. Mm, Yeah. (laughs) It's the only thing she can do with a coffee mug ever since the doctor told her (laughs) she's got to stick to tea, right? She carries it around like Bob Dole's pen. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Bob Dole doesn't need this. So the gang narrowly escapes the uh, the lockdown by uh, hopping in a kind of Star Wars-y floater vehicle. No other way to describe it, Ben. <laughs> We're going to go on a Star Wars chase. Yeah. So this chase sequence has a little uh, Murph hatching threat for Spice. But uh, yeah, they're in this like, it's got to be cold as hell. It's an open top vehicle. Mm-hmm. It's They're going through an ice planet. Yeah. They're going at high speed. Eventually, they like discover Okana like sleeping under some panel somewhere. Yeah, the chase is extremely cold, but the stowaway is so hot. Piping hot. Yeah. He really heats things up. They drop a bomb behind them. At one point, one of the Zindi cops like smashes into a wall and explodes. So another like body count Mm -hmm. in this episode. (laughs) Oh, okay. I guess that guy dying doesn't matter. It's fine if kids kill adults, right? Yeah, that's okay. (laughs) Who cares? It's like the Goonies rule. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Oh, you haven't seen that movie. Never mind. Okapa pulls out. Mm. I called him Okapa. Hmm. That's not... Who this is? I mean, he is freshening up the episode. Yeah. Okana pulls out a cylinder of Star Trek Nas, and they slam it into this speeder, and it gives them the burst that they need to leave these cops in the dust. Yeah. And they make it back to the protostar, and they go on board via a hatch in the top. Hollow Jane Way wakes up and is like, wow, how long have you guys been gone? And they're like... Not long at all. Yeah, it didn't go great. <laughs> the worst. Yeah. And they take off, and the, the, the protostar literally like pushes up out of the ice in front of Janeway Actual and crew. So they, they finally found the ship that they've been looking for. Yeah, the protostar shakes off 200 feet of snow, like avalanche snow. And this chase goes to space. We need to score a lot of land fast. The shovel ship in relation to the protostar is a scale thing that I had not really yeah. wrapped my mind around. Holy mackerel. Yeah. That thing is big as hell. It really is. It like it really lives up to the name Dauntless when you see how big it is. It is as big as it is ugly. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> I was wondering, like, this is a bit of a, uh, like, you know, Batman versus Superman question. Like, can these two ships that are very powerful in very different ways Mm -hmm. and by very different metrics go toe-to-toe? Can the USS Shovel catch the Protostar? It appears at first, like, that's a pretty even deal. Like, the Protostar goes to warp first and is pursued by the Shovel. Yeah. And they're in like a very tunnely warp environment here. The stakes are so high because having come into contact with a Starfleet vessel, they aren't sure what exactly is going to trigger the weapon under the floorboards, right? And so when they get hailed, they're like, well, we definitely can't answer the hail because what if that turns on the weapon and it and it causes the shovel ship to uh, destroy itself? And to Janeway over on the shovel ship... This is even more confusing. Like, why won't they answer? Why are they firing on me? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Murph butt dials a torpedo because Murph has hatched and is now sort of like arms and legs Murph. Yeah. Doesn't seem like Murph, like, has any, like, added intelligence after hatching, right? No. Yeah. Still just like a... 
kind of a character. Yeah, I mean, could Jelly Murph not have formed arms and legs if they wanted to? Oh. At any given point? Like, unclear what benefit this metamorphosis has for Murph yeah. going forward. We've always wondered if you could accidentally fire a torpedo by sitting on a on a screen in Star Trek, yeah. and this proves that you can. Yeah. The Diviner back in Six Bay is looking out the window. I love that there's windows in the Six Bay. It yeah. feels like all Six Bay should have windows. They're usually so close and lightless, you know? If you're ever in a circumstance where you're in a hospital, like, you definitely want the hospital room with a window. Yeah. Yeah. That'll help your healing. The hospital room that my wife delivered our, our child in did not have a window. And our doula told us, like, when you get to the hospital, like, beg them for a room with a window. It will make a huge yeah. difference. I think because a lot of times people are in labor for, like, days and days. She was mm -hmm. only in labor for, like, 12 hours. So it wasn't that big a deal for us. But, like, I could see how, like, the 36-hour labor would have been pretty shitty in the room that we got because they were like, yeah, sorry, nothing we can do. <laughs> as soon as you got in there, you moved the floor scrubber and the mop and bucket out into the hall, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah. So, yeah, in response to getting hit by a torpedo, Admiral Janeway orders them to target the Protostar's third nacelle, which that's code for dick, right? It sure is, yeah. Knock out the third nacelle. So when they try to go to, like, proto-warp or whatever they call it, doesn't work. Ensign Essentia at this moment has burst into the bridge. Onto the bridge? I think onto? Yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> the two of them are on the bridge, and the diviner is telling them that his daughter is on board that ship. I guess it depends on what deposition preposition you prefer. Yeah. And once both ships fall out of warp, out of the warp tunnel, the protostar is really crippled and kind of floating in space, but Okana realizes that they're close enough to the neutral zone that this might give them a tactical advantage, knowing that the shovel ship would never pursue them into the neutral zone. Maybe there's a, a bit of shield hocus pocus they can do to go in there undetected. And there's some negotiation, some sort of peace treaty negotiation that is going to be thrown into doubt if Janeway actual orders the Dauntless in after them, but she can't risk the protostar falling into Romulan hands. So she's going to do it. Okana's idea is so, I mean, there's so many words for it. Impetuous, unbelievable, <laughs> incredible. Handsome. Yeah. Dashing. Sure. Roguish. Ah, cat, knave, rake, rascal, villain, wild yes, elephant. Data. So many words. <laughs> <laughs> the surprise of the episode to me was Admiral Janeway ordering the shovel ship into the neutral zone to follow. Yeah. And Tysus, her first officer, has been a character that up until this point has been a total zero for me, like just... Uh, a replacement level character on the show, just a commander who who obeys orders or whatever. When he turns around and gets into it with Janeway, I was like, where did this come from? You have your orders, number one. I'm sorry, Admiral. At risk of war, I cannot fulfill them. Yeah, I kept wondering why Tysus was voiced by Davi Diggs. Because I was like, isn't yeah. that kind of like a high caliber major actor to be hiring for this character that hasn't had any interesting things to do. I was psyched that he finally got this moment. I was like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kind of out of left field. Like, uh, I mean, I guess you uh, you write the characters like they all think they're the main character of the story. Right. And uh, yeah, he's like, I, I formally protest this. I can't get behind it. I, I doth protest mm -hmm. enough, but not too much. You shot Children in the third nacelle. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay for children to kill yeah. adults, but not the other way around. There's a rule of threes happening here, Ben. Not only is it a third nacelle that's been shot, three double Ds decloak <laughs> yeah. on the Romulan side of the neutral zone. Is that what Ice Cube was talking about with fucking around and getting a triple double? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, on the shovel ship, breakfast with no hog is probably <laughs> standard. <laughs> <laughs> Ice Cube may have had a great day, but this decision at the very end may come back to haunt Rear Admiral Janeway because Commander Kasith is ripshit pissed at her yeah. and warns her. You are close to entering the neutral zone. That would be an act of war. And that is the dun 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 that ends the episode. She can't like that, Ben. Damn, the crazy rain that you had at your studio is now at my studio. Yeah. It's moving fast. Yeah. Yeah. How long did that take? About 20 minutes? It looks like a hurricane out there. It's crazy. It feels very climax to the never-ending story. (laughs) I'm here (laughs) podcasting under my tent (laughs) with a massive storm out there. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's some fake princess I'm in love with, you know. Sure. Your wife is a genuine princess, Adam. Come on. It's true. Nothing fake about her. Did you like this episode? When this episode ended, I was like, finally, right? Like, finally, shovel ship and kid ship have met. I mean, the ships have met. The the crews have not. Yeah. Well, I guess they met a little bit, but... They didn't get to know each other. You know what I mean. Right. Like, finally, they're in proximity. And I feel like for the last 10 episodes, it's all been leading up to this. And I'm relieved and happy that we're finally here. It feels like we can start expediting some story a little bit more. Truly. Uh, and I, I really could not guess what is going to happen next, you know? Yeah. I'm on the same page as you. Yeah, like, I, I watched this episode and I was at first, like, really frustrated with it. And I think that that was because the situation is frustrating. Yeah. Like, that the kids got so spooked by this thing that wasn't exactly what they had made it up in their minds to be, that they ran away from Starfleet instead of embracing Starfleet. They, you know, didn't ask for help when it was right there to be asked for. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I kind of like I was mad at the episode for that when I watched it the first time. And then the second time I watched it, I was like, that is kind of the strength of the episode. That's like what it is looking for in a viewer. And uh, I think that that's pretty admirable for especially for a show that's for kids, you know? Like, yeah, I was with you, like getting upset at kids for acting like kids did not seem like a fair way to judge their behavior. <laughs> Like, the longer I thought about it, the more I understood it. But initially, I was like, God, why didn't you just say something when you're right there? Yeah, yeah. And I think that, like, a kid watching would totally get that. And yeah, I mean, it's got to be a little bit scary to drop an episode like this as the creators of this show, because I could see it being really tough for a kid that's really invested in the story to recover from this. Right. But I, I thought it was a good one. Me too, Ben. Let's go see if we have any good Priority One messages in the inbox. Sounds like a plan. Priority One message from Starfleet coming in on Secured Channel. We've got a couple here, Adam. The first is of a promotional nature, and it goes like this. I've heard a lot of golf talk on the pod lately, so I thought I'd share a project that I'm just a little bit embarrassed to have started. Golfcourse.wiki. It's like memory alpha, but for golf courses. Share your tips for your local muni and check out local advice for other public courses while you're at it. We can build an online community to make golf more accessible to everyone. From the lower decks to the captain's yacht, come check it out. P.S. See you at the punchline in SF soon. Wow, I just went over to golfcourse.wiki. This is amazing. The LA golf course that I've clicked on is the Los Feliz three-par golf course that is you know, you go to a par three golf course, that's a fun couple of hours. One of those shorties, you just bring a wedge and a putter out there. Oh, that sounds great. It's got some holes mapped. A lot of hole information. Four. Wow. On this site. Tells you where you can eat around there. Man. I love it. That sounds, if you're into golf, that sounds great. This is a good idea. So visit golfcourse.wiki and add your course today. And hey, I just have one correction. We're going to be at Cobbs, not the punchline. Oh, yeah. Bigger room. Yeah. I mean, we'll we'll be at the punchline watching a bunch of comedy during 
Sketchfest. But yeah. yeah, we'll be at Cobb's performing. Yeah, if you see us at the punchline, say hi to us, but For sure. we won't be there to perform. Yeah. Ben, our second priority one message is from Chris, and it's to Barnes Franks. <laughs> message goes like this mashup prediction. Did Drukmani collect your copious haploid remains, create a Barnes clone, then slap Rutherford's badgie implant on said clone? <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> I don't dislike that idea. I don't believe there is a 0% chance of that. Man, the crossover between Prodigy and Lower Decks. Are they happening kind of concurrently? It seems like they kind of are, right? It does seem that way, yeah. Yeah, wow. That could happen. And because they're both animated, it seems like they'd be great to cross over. Yeah. I wonder how much the audiences cross over, though. <laughs> like, Ooh. if you're telling a bunch of kids to come over and watch the cartoon where they say, fuck a bunch. Yeah. Where Boimler <laughs> shows gape. <laughs> <laughs> hey, kids! <laughs> Is this what Star Trek has become? <laughs> well, this is what our show has become, Ben. Uh, priority One messages are one of the primary ways to support it. Yeah. In order to do so, you can take it on over to MaximumFun.org slash Jumbotron and have us read your message on an episode of Greatest Trek. Do it. Hey, Adam. What's that, Ben? Did you discover yourself a Barnes Franks? Uh -huh. Barnes Franks. Barnes Franks. Barnes Franks. Barnes Franks. Just so humiliated that our editor has to ever hear us do that one time, much less every time. <laughs> I could not tell if in the last episode that was a brand new version or if it was just pulled from the episode before. <laughs> I'm going to keep doing it because I think the live takes are being used. Mm. That's what I believe. Wow. I also believe my Barnes Franks is going to be Billy Campbell, Billy Campbell actual. Wow. The voice actor in this case, who has come back a couple of times in the last few years to reprise his role. As O'Connor. I think that's great. I love the callback. I love that he's yeah. willing to do it. I love that he does such a great job at it. He's my Barnes Franks. What about you? I'm super into it as well. For my Barnes Franks, I'm going to give it to Barnes Franks. <laughs> wow. Not really sure what he's up to, whether he's like actually trying to get back to Starfleet. If not, why not? Like, does he feel slighted by the position they put him in? What kind of chaos agent did he imagine he was going to become before they came and just grabbed him? Yeah. <laughs> and then, like, he is surprisingly good at bullshitting Admiral Janeway when she starts questioning him. Like, his answers really square up with, like, I am totally innocent here and, like, you should just rescue me and, and think no more of it. I thought the same thing. When we first met him and as we got to know him, his brand of bullshittery didn't feel credible in a way like did not feel dangerous did not feel anything I, I just felt like well yeah no one's gonna trust him no one's gonna believe him but like to see him implement those tools yeah in his own defense made me respect him more and I don't mean respect him as a person because I don't <laughs> but like respect his his ability yeah in that way yeah you can't knock the hustle no I don't I never do well, Adam, I think that just about does it for this episode of Greatest Trek. Can't knock our hustle. No, can't do it. Ben, one of the ways Friends of DeSoto warn strangers about our podcast is <laughs> via warning buoy. Prepare a buoy and launch it when ready. Warning buoys. An emergency buoy. A warning buoy. Today's warning bois comes from a great friend of DeSoto, a friend of the show, and a, a real-life hang for you and me when we go to Star Trek Las Vegas. Yeah. It's Anne-Marie Siegel. At Anne-Marie Siegel 1 is her Twitter handle. Her message goes like this. From now on, anyone who wants to ask me out on a date must do so via Greatest Trek Priority 1 message. Yeah. <laughs> if you... 
would like to court the lovely Anne Marie Siegel. There is only one way to do it, folks. Yeah. Priority one messages. The way to her heart. (laughs) (laughs) Not quite a warning, but an invitation. Yeah, sort of the opposite, really. I know. Really brings into sharp relief the irony of the name we chose for this segment. (laughs) I think it works most of the time, as intended. Maybe not this time. (laughs) Uh, What fun. Anne-Marie, one of the most delightful people that we've gotten to meet through all of this. Wow. Uh, Well, if you'd like to... Hear your words flying out of our mouths. Or date a friend of DeSoto, I guess? Yeah, post about the show on social media, tag at Greatest Trek, and uh, you might hear it at the end of a Greatest Trek episode one day soon. Don't be creepy. Anne-Marie rules. Yeah. Anybody being creepy to Anne-Marie has to answer to Ben and Adam, which is probably not much of a threat. But (laughs) Yeah, maybe we should say Bill. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Okay, you have to answer to Bill and Wendy. I'll fucking kick your ass. Greatest Trek is an Uxbridge Shimoda podcast on the Maximum Fun Network. It's hosted by Ben Harrison and Adam Pranica, and it's produced and edited by Wendy Pretty. Next up on Star Trek Prodigy Season 1, Episode 15, it's called Masquerade. Trapped in the neutral zone, the crew encounters a rogue geneticist who sheds light on Dahl's past. Thank you to the members who are making monthly contributions to support this show. If you've got an extra $5 a month, head on over to MaximumFun.org slash join, and you'll get instant access to the entire catalog of MaxFun bonus content, with new episodes from Uxbridge Shimoda coming out each month. Adam Ragusia created the original music that you hear throughout the show. You can find his podcast and YouTube cooking channel by searching for Adam Ragusia. Thanks to Nick Ditmore for the show art, and thanks to Bill Tilly, who manages the social media pages on Instagram and Twitter. Make sure you're following at Greatest Trek and use the hashtag Greatest Trek to talk about the show online. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week on Greatest Trek. We did this one in a rainstorm. It did. I can't believe the power stayed on. I know. MaximumFun.org Comedy and culture. Artist owned. Audience supported.